No Credits Rolled. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 10 of No Credits Rolled. That's right, we've made it to 10 episodes. My name is Sam Whalen, of course, always your host. Uh, but yeah, 10 episodes is a big deal. Uh, so I just want to thank everybody for listening. If you've listened, downloaded, shared the show, if you've been there since episode one, uh, when I used to stutter and say, um, slightly more than I do now, uh, I really appreciate it. You know, 10 episodes is a big deal for me. When I started this show, I wasn't really sure how long I was going to go with it, how much I was going to do. And, you know, before you know it, we're at episode 10. So thanks. Uh, but before we get started, of course, I have to do the usual plugs. Uh, we are on TikTok and YouTube at No Credits Rolled, so go check us out there. Trying to get that TikTok following going, uh, just because it's fun to go viral there if we can. And, of course, you can also continue to subscribe uh, and tell everyone you know, everyone you know to subscribe on uh, every podcast service, Spotify, Apple, wherever you get your podcast. No Credits Rolled will be there for you. Ten episodes down, hopefully ten billion more to go. Anyway, thanks again for episode ten, and I appreciate each and every one of you. Let's start the show. Now get out there and make someone smile. All right, so last week we did a little bit more review-centric show, uh, and this week we're going back to the news just because there were two things that I really cannot avoid uh, talking about, and that really interests me and I think might interest you too. First story we got is, of course, you've probably heard uh, that Call of Duty Black Ops 6 is reportedly set to launch straight into Xbox Games Pass. This, of course, was rumored for a while that now with the Xbox uh, Blizzard, Blizzard Activision sort of merger that, hey, is COD going to come to Games Pass? Is Xbox going to play that card? And it looks like they finally are. So this is from Wesley Yin Pool over at IGN. Quote, Microsoft will soon announce its intention to release this year's mainline Call of Duty game straight into Games Pass, according to a new report. The Wall Street Journal reports that Microsoft will announce the plans during its Xbox showcase, showcase event in June, which I think that is rumored for the next two weeks, maybe. June 9th, I feel like I heard. Uh, this is from the Wall Street Journal article. They said, quote, Microsoft plans a major shakeup of its video game sales strategy by releasing the coming installment of Call of Duty to its subscription service instead of the longtime lucrative approach of only selling it a la carte. Uh, Microsoft declined to comment <laughs> when contacted by the publication. So they're probably saving this for their big showcase. Um, so, yeah, this is Xbox finally playing their big card, I think. Um, what is this going to look like? What is this going to look like for Xbox? What is this going to look like for Call of Duty as a series? Uh, we're going to try to break a little bit of that down here on the show today. So the first thing I want to look at is how will this impact Call of Duty sales? 2023 was the first time in a long time that Call of Duty wasn't the best-selling game. Uh, Hogwarts Legacy beat it out, beat out Modern Warfare 3 last year, which of course, uh, Modern Warfare 3 had a pretty rough launch and pretty terrible reputation, so that probably didn't help. However, I did a little bit more digging here. Technically, Call of Duty remained the best-selling franchise in 2023 due to the release of both MW2 and MW3. Uh, that kind of boosted the numbers and kept COD as the best franchise. But in terms of number one best-selling game, uh, Hogwarts Legacy did beat out Call of Duty last year. So a little bit of a dip, I would say, going into uh, going into 2024 and 2023. And, you know, I think Call of Duty is definitely trying to bounce back from that. People were not happy with MW3 at launch. Uh, like I said, very rocky launch. Many calling it essentially DLC and longtime fans being very disappointed with the, I think it was roughly three-hour campaign. I mean, I'll never forget we had the, uh, who was it? Um, Christopher Judge at the Game Awards that year, or last year, making fun of it. And he, he did a little dig at it at the Game Awards, which... You know, I'm sure the people that made that game weren't thrilled about, but um, it was it was pretty funny at the time. But yeah, roughly three hour campaign, people were not happy, and uh, even the um, the structure of that campaign was not your traditional Call of Duty. Uh, you know, big set pieces, big moments, big levels. It very much seemed to be the majority of it take place on war zone maps and sort of let you do more open ended stuff, which was pitched in the sales thing as being like, well, Call of Duty's maybe making a shift more towards a far cry where you can go about it your own way, when in reality it was really just easier to make it that way because you could incorporate kill streaks that already were in the game, incorporate locations that were already in the game with Warzone maps, and sort of churn it out um, as fast as possible to get MW3 out. That's not to mention the story direction things took, which I'll be honest, I kind of fell off the Call of Duty story uh, with the new remake. Once, you know, I love the first remake, well, I guess it's the second remake because they remade four, but the 2019 one, that original one that came out, I absolutely love that game. My friends and I played a ton of it. It was a special moment. It was also right around COVID lockdown, so that kind of helped, but I love that game quite a bit. 
and there were, you know, things that happened in that game, and I, I can spoil it. it, it's been like four years. So Alex, Alex is like one of your main characters. He gets blown up in that campaign. He sacrifices himself for some reason, I don't remember why. He blows up, right? But then they bring him back in a season of Warzone, and it like totally deflates any kind of I don't know, dramatic, like, gravitas they want to have with the story if they're just going to do this stuff in Warzone, if the story, quote-unquote, will continue in Warzone. But, like, it's not the same. And when they started doing stuff like that, that was kind of when I fell off of, okay, what is this narrative here? I was, you know, I bought Modern Warfare 2 just for the gameplay um, because, you know, that, that system, that engine that those remakes run on is still very fun to play in. And then the story in that game, I really wasn't paying attention, if I'll be honest. Uh, I know there were some levels levels in that mission, or in that uh, game, rather, that I really do, did not enjoy. There were some that were better than others, but I think overall, MW2 was a step back from the first game. And then, in the th- I never even played Modern Warfare 3, I'll be honest. I, I saw it was critically panned. I wasn't going to shell out that kind of money for it. Um, and I just never, never played it because it was, it was so terribly reviewed and it seemed like it was really the sort of epitome of this modern Call of Duty error, trying to get as much money out of people as possible. And I just wasn't really there for it. So with all that being said, I mean, Warzone continues to dominate in the multiplayer market. Uh, it's raking in millions of dollars for Activision, which is now also Xbox. So it's a moneymaker there. My question sort of is here, with Xbox having so many projects fall through, studio closures, PlayStation outselling them in consoles, Xbox is not in a great spot, so will Call of Duty be the one to dig them out? Uh, I think, if anything, it reflects the direction Xbox is kind of going in the future. I mean, even in the the, uh, IGN report, they said uh, a major shakeup of the video game sales strategy, and that's kind of what I'm talking about here. They are kind of moving away from that traditional console release cycle of you know, whatever they were going to call it, the Xbox Series X 2.0. I don't know. The naming conventions with Xbox kind of got out of hand. But they're moving away from that console cycle, and, and it seems like they're going more into being a digital library of games that you can hypothetically play anywhere, whether that be through the xCloud or an app on your TV or with the uh, sort of slimmed down Series S variant that doesn't have a disk drive but is very small and very portable and very impressive, honestly. Um, with what it can do. So that is maybe where they're more shifting towards. And so if they want to grow that online catalog with Games Pass and with other things, well, really just Games Pass because they did away with Games of Gold, imagine if Call of Duty was in that ecosystem. It would be a huge get for them. And not just, you know, Black Ops 6. I have here later in the notes, but I'll skip to it now. Imagine a world where we get all of those Call of Duty games, every single one, on Games Pass. I mean... I mean, that's a, that'd be a pretty big deal. Call of Duty is one of those franchises that seemingly never goes on sale, It's but it's always there. I see it on sale all the time on the Xbox um, store. And if they come out and they say, every Call of Duty ever available on Games Pass right now, especially, and I don't even know if they'd be able to do this, if they could do it where the multiplayer servers for all those games are up too. That, I mean, I think that'd be a pretty big deal. Now, I know servers are up now for, I'll jump into Black Ops 2 and stuff occasionally, but those games are so riddled with hackers. But I think if Microsoft comes in and streamlines it and says, hey, we're kicking, I mean, there's cheaters in Warzone now, so I don't, maybe there's no way to prevent cheating. But if they come out and they say, hey, these games are available right now, you can go download them. Black Ops 6 comes out in, what, November? And, you know, but now you can go play all those old Call of Duty games. I think, you know, that that would be a pretty big get for them. But back to the impact on Call of Duty sales. We've talked about before on this show how Games Pass is pretty notorious for hurting initial sales of games, and with Call of Duty retailing at $70 nowadays, with most most games retailing that high, is Xbox going to shoot itself in the foot, right, by hurting Activision sales numbers, therefore hurting Xbox sales numbers by putting this thing out on Games Pass. I think the risk-reward here that they're going for is hoping that by putting this Call of Duty out on Games Pass, you bump up those Games Pass subscriber numbers, And those people stay subscribed, which becomes a monthly payment, which would theoretically net you more revenue than a one-time $70 purchase. Is that what's going to happen? I don't know. (laughs) Uh, I personally, I could see it boosting subs in the short term, but I don't think 
that is going to lead to sustainable growth and consistent growth. I think you're going to see a big surge of it if you do see a surge. And I wouldn't be surprised if there was a price hike to go with this of Xbox Games Pass. And then if you get those old COD games on there, you know, you're going to see a big boost. But again, I don't think there's going to be anything long term in terms of the growth of Games Pass. That is, of course, unless Black Ops 6 comes out and like blows everybody out of the water. Personally, I have been I've been pretty disappointed with most Call of Duty games, except for that 2019 Modern Warfare. I've been pretty disappointed with them. I was I didn't really like Cold War. I know people that was sort of like a sleeper uh, hit that people liked because we were so deep in the Modern Warfare uh, craze that to get Cold War, I don't think it was talked about as much. They really just haven't been grabbing me like they used to. And I, I think if Black Ops Six comes out, I'm definitely. I mean, now that it's on Games Pass, I'm definitely in because I probably wasn't going to buy it before. Because I, uh, like I said, I skipped MW3. I did end up picking up Modern Warfare 2. Uh, but I, you know, I've been ebbing and flowing on Call of Duty. But I'm definitely going to give it a shot, right? And I hope it's good. And, but if it is, like, I'm talking, like, next level good, like the way people talk about Black Ops 1 and 2 and those campaigns and how they're must-play campaigns if you're a first-person shooter fan, then that's going to be a different story. That's going to get way more people coming into Games Pass. And it could be a game changer for Microsoft. I personally, I'm not going to get my hopes up, um, but that'd be great to see. It'd be great for Call of Duty as a franchise. It'd be great for Microsoft and it'd be great for all the people involved. I was able to find some data here on Games Pass subscribers because um, until recently, this is data from February, but before February, we really didn't have any concrete numbers on what the kind of growth that Games Pass was dealing with looked like. Uh, but this is February 2024. They said they hit 34 million subs. Now, their targeted goal way back when was 100 million subs by 2030. And that is seeming less likely every year. But I mean, you know, you're kind of a third of the way there in both time and subs. So maybe. But I'm pretty sure Xbox uh, sort of dollied back those uh, estimates once they saw that subscribers were kind of plateauing for a while there. I am curious to see if we will get numbers maybe at this presentation to go with the announcement of Black Ops 6 coming to Games Pass, if we'll get more numbers, if we'll get a price increase. I am worried about that, but it wouldn't surprise me if this is really where Xbox is going, if we're not going to get another quote-unquote new Xbox console, and if they're going to just double down on this Games Pass stuff, I would not be surprised if there's a price increase. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I'm curious what it will do for the COD franchise and for and for Games Pass but I really, I hope the game is good. I want to jo- enjoy another Black Ops game. I really liked 1 and 2 and 3 and 4. <laughs> uh, and, you know, the campaign for Cold War wasn't that bad. It just, by that point, I just, it wasn't what I was looking for. But I am going in optimistic with this Black Ops 6. And, you know, I hope at least the campaign is is quality. And I hope the multiplayer is fun. As for Warzone, you know, I, Warzone is what it is. I really was into Warzone when it first came out with that 2019 Modern Warfare, my friends and I, we played a ridiculous amount of it during lockdown. But, you know, now it's just, I, I find it to be pretty pay to win. I find it to be very meta chasing with people just picking the best guns with the best attachments and then just destroying you. It's the same thing I complain about with all multiplayer games on this show. You know, if people are just going to be better than you and dominate you. Then why am I going to waste my time playing your game? And Warzone, I think, has gotten a lot worse with that over time as they add more guns. Like the shift from Warzone 1 and 2 where, you know, the guns, the recoil and the way the guns felt is so much different and so much easier to control that, you know, it's just not what it used to be. And I think the all the added mechanics, it you know, it's what you see in a lot of these, you know, free-to-play live service games that go on for so long. They just become so bloated and it's difficult to just have that stripped down classic fun you used to have before. Again, I sound like an old man, but hey, that's just my opinion. So yeah, I don't know how this is going to work with Warzone, but I'm sure it will be some sort of major update, and I'm assuming Warzone will stay free. I don't see why it wouldn't. They're making money hand over fist with it. Why would you charge for that? And now you'll be able to get that whole package all on Xbox. So we'll have to see what happens. We'll have to see what this presentation looks like whenever that drops. I will probably cover it on this show. Um, depending on the timing of it, I might be a little late to it, but, you know, check it out whenever I do, whenever that does drop, I will most likely get to it. But yeah, um, yeah, that's all I got to say about COD coming to Games Pass. Let me know what you think. Are you a Games Pass subscriber? Do you play every Call of Duty when it comes out? How do you feel about 
this uh, sort of exclusivity here with Xbox Games Pass. But anyway, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll be covering the PlayStation Showcase. You're listening to No Credits Rolled. We're going to talk a little bit about the latest PlayStation sh- uh, State of Play. I almost said Showcase. They're two different things. Uh, typically, I think these State of Plays are usually supposed to be a little bit lower key, uh, not necessarily the big crazy reveals that we come to expect from Sony. They sort of save those for the showcases. Uh, that being said, it's it's hard to go into these any kind of developer or um, studio, you know, presentation without shooting for the moon, right? Without wanting that one release you've been wanting for years or that one hype announcement that you don't see coming that really takes you off guard. Uh, And I'm guilty of that every time I watch one of these, I'm waiting for that hype reveal. But honestly, this this state of play was pretty low-key. Not a whole lot of crazy things. And I'm really just going to cover the stuff that interested me. Obviously, if you want to see the whole thing, you can go check it out yourself. There were some things. I'm, there are the majority of the thing I'm not going to cover, honestly, because it really doesn't appeal to me, and I really don't find much of it interesting to talk about. But, you know, it's still worth your time if you do want to check out the whole thing. Uh, so the first thing I want to cover here, by the way, uh, just to preface, uh, everything I'm going to be quoting here is from Taylor Lyles at IGN. They did a very good breakdown of everything that was announced, so you can go read that article if you want the full breakdown as well. First thing I want to cover here is a game called Concord or Concord from Firewalk Studios. And this is from Taylor Lyles at IGN. Quote, starting the May 2024 state of play, Sony unveiled a new gameplay trailer for Firewalk Studios' upcoming 5v5 multiplayer shooter, Concord. The new trailer showed a pre-rendered cutscene. We love those pre-rendered cutscenes. Can't get enough of those. Showcasing a ragtag group of guns for hire. After the extended cutscene, Firewalk Studios provided a first and detailed look at Concord's gameplay. Uh, blah, 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 various characters, various styles. It's it's a 5v5 hero shooter, everybody. We know what those look like. Uh, it's going to be released on PC and PS5 August 23rd, and there will be a beta in July. Look, I mean, this this is another hero shooter. I don't know why they're making this game at this at this time, I feel like this game kind of already looks dead in the water and it hasn't even had a beta yet or hasn't even come out yet. It looks very generic. You know, a lot of times when I talk with my friends about these reveals, I talk about the kind of games that you would see in a movie that like kids are playing in the background that isn't a real game because they couldn't get the license to something. So they just made up a fake game. This game kind of looks like that. Uh, That being said, if I can get in on the beta, I will definitely check it out. You know, I like hero shooters, even if they're generic looking. I like to try new games like this. So, you know, maybe I'll check it out if given the chance. When it comes out, I don't know how long it's going to last. I mean, August 2023, that's probably going to be right before Call of Duty, assuming if Call of Duty drops in November or September, it usually drops in the fall. Like, I don't know where this game is going to fit in people's, like, shooter ecosystem you know i hope it does well for the studio i you know i i know i don't know what firewalk studios has done before i personally haven't heard of them but you know if they're if this is like their big their big moment in the sun to sort of shine i hope it goes well for them but i don't know what is going to make this game stand out and what is going to draw people's eyes to this unfortunately you know in a world where a lot of games are either established like a war zone or they're using big ips to get people in you know we're going to talk about uh, multiverses later in the show. But people play that game just because of the IPs they know. It's tough to do something wholly unique and still get people involved. I mean, there have been countless examples of these free-to-play... I don't know if this game's free-to-play. I could not um, could not figure that out. But the the point is, like, these, these wholly unique ideas that come out that are 5v5 hero shooters or something like that that don't really have the sauce to make it stand out... And end up failing. And, you know, we're going to see what happens here with Concord. But, like I said, I hope the best for the studio and the devs and all that. Uh, I just, I wanted to highlight it because I will probably check it out if I can. Just because I do like these types of games. So we'll see what happens. Speaking of hero shooters, uh, this was probably my f- my most hype announcement. Even though it's, like, kind of nothing. <laughs> uh, but Marvel Rivals is coming to PS5. A closed beta is set for July uh, so I don't know if I've talked about it on this show yet because I, you know, I turn on the microphone and black out for 45 minutes. But uh, if you haven't seen it, Marvel Rivals is the superhero team-focused PvP shooter. These are quotes from uh, Lyles over at IGN again. 
featuring Marvel Comics superheroes, appeared at the State of Play today. In addition to PC and Mac, the Team Shooter was confirmed to receive a PS5 version when the game eventually releases. Uh, unfortunately, the game still doesn't have a release date, but we got more gameplay. And there was recently, this is, this is now Sam talking. There was an alpha recently, so there's lots of gameplay out there you can go check out if you want. Showcasing, you know, different maps, all the different heroes. It's, it, was a, it was a pretty fleshed out build of the game on PC. Uh, one final quote here from Lyles over at IGN. Additionally, developed NetEase Games announced that a closed beta test will be held sometime in July, with more details set to be provided as the te- test month draws near. You can bet your bottom dollar I'm going to try to get in on that. Uh, because I am very excited for this game. I have wanted a game like this for a long time. Uh, I'm a diehard Overwatch fan, less so now since they've kind of ran that game into the ground, but especially when Overwatch initially came out, it was, I used to say it was my favorite game of all time. So to get that with the Marvel Universe, with the Marvel characters, and from what I've seen in the alpha, they are unabashedly just stealing from Overwatch in terms of gameplay mechanics. There are characters in Rivals that function just like characters in Overwatch. Uh, There are maps in Rivals that look just like Overwatch maps. It is borderline, like, legal, legally actionable, <laughs> uh, but we'll see. Uh, I think a, a reason they're doing that, they're being so similar, is that so people know the language when they start this game, because, you know, if you're jumping into one of these games for the first time, it's tough to pick, to know what character to start playing as, because, you know, you're presented this roster, and you're like, okay, well, I don't know... These people all have unique abilities. I don't know what anybody does. But if you know the language of Overwatch, which is a popular now free-to-play game as well, you can jump in and say, okay, well, Hulk kind of plays like D.Va. I like D.Va, so I'll play the Hulk. There is a language there that is nice, assuming they don't get sued. But, you know, I'm very excited for this game. I knew it was uh, coming to PC, and I was kind of bummed, but I, I assumed we were going to get a console release at some point, and it's I love that we got this announcement this early and this soon. Uh, beta test in July says here more details set to be provided as the test test month draws near. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's almost June. It, it might be June by the time this airs. So hopefully we get some more information on that soon. You know, I'm super excited for that. Uh, and I will, I will do whatever I have to, to get in that beta if I can, you know, if I gotta, you know, maybe they're going to make me buy the founders bundle, the collector's edition, you know, maybe I'll do it. We'll see. Cause I am very excited about this game and, uh, I hope it doesn't suck. You know, that would be bad. That would not be a good time if I play this game and it sucks, but we'll see. There's a lot of we'll see on this section of the show because it is a state of play. It is announcements. It is reveals. It is trailers. So it's a lot of speculation on what it, where are we actually going to get once we get these games in our hands. Uh, next up, Capcom shared a new look at the new Monster Hunter game, Monster Hunter Wilds. I believe we got a title reveal of this maybe in Summer Games Fest last year. There was some presentation where they did the title reveal, but we got more gameplay here. A uh, new trailer. Uh, it looks really good. Like graphically, it looks like a, a maybe a departure uh, from Monster Hunter World and Monster Hunter Rise. I know with Rise they tried to do a little bit of a pared down, graphically uh, intensive game because of where that launched initially. But it looks like they're you know really shooting for the moon here with Monster Hunter Wilds. Uh, it looks like a lot of fun. I really like. Monster Hunter is one of those games that I really would like to get into and really, like, make it soak up all my time. But every time I try to play one of these games, you know, I played a decent amount of World and I played a little bit of Rise. It's like I always feel like I'm late to the party with these games. I always feel like I get in there late and I, you know, my friends and I played World a little bit. But you really, I know this game is enhanced by playing with friends and it's tough to sort of stick with a group playing these games because, first of all, at least in World the party up system was like really obtuse and not simple at all. I think I talked last week, I think it was last week, about how when it comes to these multiplayer games, for me, it's important to have that ease of access of just being able to squad up with your friends. And Monster Hunter World is not one of those games. It is a pain. And, you know, that sort of was a turnoff for us because we just want to boot up the game, squad up, and start playing. We don't want to, you know, maybe we're we're drowning in all these fantastic games that we're privileged saying this, but you know, I feel like if you're going to make a multiplayer game, you should make it easy to be able to play multiplayer. I don't know. Anyway, I hope this game is, you know, decent. It looks great. Uh, I will check it out eventually. I don't know if I'll be picking this one up on release, but I will check it out if it comes to some kind of free service, maybe, or if I can pick it up on sale, um, you know, uh, we'll, we'll definitely try to check it out. 
Uh, I think this is the last announcement we have here, and this was probably my second. This is probably the one I should be most hyped for, but I'm not just because I like have such an interest in Marvel Rivals. But last announcement here is Team Asobi unveils new Astrobot game coming this September. Now, if you haven't played the other Astrobot games, there is the second Astrobot game, I think, the one that isn't VR. It is like incredible, and I feel like it's kind of slept on. I feel like a lot of people didn't play that game. Uh, because of how it released and where it released. But the Astro Buck games are fantastic. I mean, they're like, it's like Sony's version of a Mario game, and I feel like it doesn't get the uh, sort of acclaim and recognition that they deserve. The games are fantastic. Highly recommend you go play them if you like those kind of 3D platformers. And now we're getting a new one, and I think that's that's fantastic news. And it's coming out on September the 6th, so not that far away. It's uh, just titled Astrobot, apparently. This is, again, from Taylor Lyles over at IGN. Team Asobi's next project debuted an adorable gameplay trailer and explained in a PS blog post that players will explore over 80 levels. That is a lot of levels uh, as they look for Astro's missing crew. And the one of the charming aspects of this game is because it's a Sony exclusive, you get a lot of Sony Easter eggs. You get um, all kinds of Sony references. So we had references to Uncharted, to... Uh, Parappa the Rapper, God of War. It's just really charming, and it's really cool. And if you like Sony and you're going to pick up on these references, uh, it's a lot of fun, on top of it being a fantastic platformer. And the way they incorporate the um, haptic feedback and the uh, functionality of the dual sense into the controller. It's a little gimmicky, but it's like the best version of gimmicky, where you know you the way they do the haptics, especially in the triggers and stuff for the, the second game that came out, is really, really impressive. And it really showcases what that DualSense controller is capable of that not a whole lot of games nowadays are utilizing, I think, to its fullest extent. So yeah, new Astrobot game coming out in September. Definitely going to check that one out. Uh, I highly recommend you go play the other ones if you can get your hands on them, if you're on PlayStation. They're a ton of fun, and they don't really take that long to beat either. I think you can beat them in you know maybe under 10 hours. And you know Astrobot, he's an adorable little guy. He's a good. He's a great mascot too. You know, I know we're kind of past the age of mascots for franchises and and companies, but he's a great mascot. Shout out, shout out, Astrobot. So yeah, that's pretty much everything I got for the May 2024 Sony State of Play. Uh, let me know what you think. Did you check out the State of Play? Are there any big announcements you were looking forward to? Maybe some of the stuff I didn't cover here on the show. Did anything catch your eye, or were you maybe let down? Did you like myself set your expectations absurdly high, uh, and maybe not have them fulfilled? Let me know. Anyway, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, it's time for the review portion of the show. You're listening to No Credits Rolled. All right, and we're back on No Credits Rolled. Now, for the review portion of the show, uh, I did tease it. We are going to do it. It's the Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door review. Uh, This is, of course, the remake of the 2004 GameCube Classic. Uh, This is a fun little blurb I got when I was doing my research from the Super Mario Wiki. So this is a quote from that. The title features visually enhanced and updated graphics, along with new gameplay features. However, it remains faithful to the style of the original game. The characters still use their designs from the original release. And this is the best part. In parentheses, notably, Princess Peach keeps her pre-Mario Party 4 dress design, rather than the updated designs used in the following Paper Mario games. So... I mean, someone's really locking down here, getting these these designs um, accurate. I didn't even know the 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 landmark change in Princess Princess Peach's dress pre in a pre Mario Party Four world. I mean, anyway, um, yeah. So this is my first Mario RPG, and I'm really enjoying it so far. It's pretty fun. I love the design. Uh, I think the thing I love most about this game is that art style, that paper art style. Something about that paper aesthetic, it's very appealing to me. And I honestly, guys, this might be my favorite Mario design. Something about the way he looks with his dead little eyes and and that 2D sort of 3D flat Stanley look he's got going on. I absolutely love it. There's something simplistic about it that I think really shines. And it's not just Mario. I mean, everybody in this game, you see it in Princess Peach, you see it in Bowser, sort of. Uh, I just love the designs in this game. I think that paper look is really appealing to me. And um, I'm glad I got to experience this game sort of up in for 2024, 20 years later. Uh, I'm glad that a whole new audience like myself is getting to experience this classic game. And it the game is a classic, and you can see why uh, just the second you boot it up. You know, there's I, going back to that design aspect of it, there's moments where when the characters are standing still or moving, you can, like, see 
You know, like when you have a sticker and the back of the sticker is white, but the front of it is the design of the sticker. So it's kind of like that in the game where you can see the back of like the edges sort of of where the paperness of him is. It's hard to describe. I'll have gameplay footage in the video version. You can check it out. But it's it's awesome. You know, it's it's a really unique design. I know that they did a couple of these games and I'm sure people are like screaming at their their listing device saying, hey, you know, this paper style has been around for forever. Where have you been? Well, I'm just getting to it now. And I, I think it looks great. And it also incorporates it into the gameplay design, the world design of, you know, staircases sort of folding over. Uh, Mario can transform into a variety of paper things to navigate the world. All that stuff is great, and I think it's really clever, especially when you put it into an RPG, exploring the world, gaining new traversal abilities, things like that. The game looks very crisp, and I think it makes that par- uh, paper cardboard aspect look even better. Now, it is 30 frames a second, but and I know I'm the first one to complain about frame rates here, but honestly, like I really didn't even notice. Um, I didn't notice until I heard someone mention it on a different show. And, you know, when it comes to Switch games, it's like it doesn't need to be 120 frames. I would love it if it was. I would love if games like Zelda and Pokemon played at that that high frame rate. But especially with this with this game, I think something about the art style, you really don't notice the 30 frames. It's very smooth. And the combat, which I'll get to in a second, the there's a timing mechanic where you have to do certain inputs to, you know, enhance your attack or do a better block. And the frame rate does not impact the timing of that. It's not that hard to do, uh, which is good to see because, you know, I see if you told me it was 30 frames going in, I would, you know, probably want to give it like a ding for that. But it really I couldn't really tell. Is that because the switch is old? Maybe. (laughs) Um, But who knows? Now, the actual RPG mechanics are pretty fun. Uh, Like I just said, it involves hitting certain button prompts during turn based combat. I think I, this is maybe my preferred method of combat in RPG. One of the South Park games did it too. And those South Park games were sort of my first introduction to the, uh, because they were paying homage to all these classic RPGs and they all had different uh, combat styles. And one of them, I can't remember which one, one of them had this like turn-based thing where you would do active time-based things in the combat. And I really do enjoy that. I think it combines the aspects of turn-based, which I like because there's not a whole lot of like, stress (laughs) stress <laughs> honestly and but it also gives you that engagement with when you do an attack hit this button it keeps you in the loop of the game because if you know just straight turn base can get a little bit boring i think in my opinion so to add that extra element that really can make or break a you know a fight you know if you time a guard right and you take zero damage when mario's on one hp you're gonna be able to keep going when you otherwise would have lost and i think it's pretty cool there's other elements that are neat to it too, where you're using the left stick and pulling back, or you're using uh, different inputs that I, I just think it's really unique, and I, I think it really helps you stay engaged in the combat. Uh, one thing that I want to mention is this game really has an edge to it that I was just not expecting. Uh, you can tell it was from that GameCube era of Mario, where he was a little angrier, and like the property in general was a little bit edgier. The first thing that comes to mind for me is like Super Mario Strikers, where like Mario would like kick somebody in the head and hit him into electrical fences. So you're getting a little bit of that Mario here where he's not necessarily as polished uh, and as as a, like a as much of like a friendly neighborhood mascot as you as you would think. And the world is very like there's a humor to the whole world too that I think is is interesting. And I like that they kept all that stuff in the original game. Uh, you know, like I said in the notes here, Mario's a lot nicer nowadays, but it's funny to see the sense of humor Thousand Year Door has. I mean, there have been like comedy bits and jokes in the game that have made me laugh out loud, which is nice. Uh, there was one in particular that's fairly early in the game where you're, you have a Koopa, the little, the turtle guys, he has a, he's one of your companions and he's looking for his dad and you find a dry bones, which are the skeleton Koopas. And he's like, dad, no. And he finds a note on him that like is talking about, you know, my last wishes to my son, blah, 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 blah. But then it says like a different name at the end. Like it's not your companion's name. And then he's like, oh, I guess it wasn't my dad. And I don't know, that was really funny to me, and I didn't expect that. It was, like, really dire for a second. I was like, oh, my God, did this guy just find his dead father, like, in a Mario game? Uh, it seemed like a bit much, but then, of course, they turned it into a joke. Uh, that got me. Uh, the music is on point. You know, endless, catchy battle and traveling themes, the kind of stuff you would expect from these classic RPGs. Uh, and a fun detail that I'm sure fans of the original will enjoy, you can equip a badge, which is, like, sort of your gear, and it sets all the music and sound effects to the sounds from the original game. So if you want that old GameCube uh, sort of 
uh, vibe. You can equip that, which I think is a nice touch, especially for fans of the original that are now playing the remake. Uh, but yeah, I'm eager to play this game. Uh, I was hypothetically thinking about getting through way more of it for this review than I wanted to, uh, and then I end, what I ended up doing. Uh, it's going to take me a lot longer than I thought, but that's the benefit of hosting a show called No Credits Road. You don't have to finish these games to talk about them. Um, but yeah, I'm eager to keep playing. Uh, like I said, it's going to be a lot longer and deeper and lengthier than I was expecting, but I think it's going to be really fun. And the one thing, the one takeaway that I want to leave you with here is that it makes you want to play other Mario RPGs. I know they just did a Mario RPG remake that I want to check out now. I had never played a Mario RPG before. I only know Mario as the platforming guy or the Smash Brothers guy or the kart racing guy or the soccer player guy or the golf guy or the baseball guy. Never as an RPG guy. So this was a nice change of pace, you know, nice change of pace for my relationship with the old Italian plumber there. Uh, but I want to definitely check out these other games and see what they're like in comparison to this one. And I hope we get more remakes too, because I think Nintendo's handling these remakes of these classic games pretty well. And I think they're, you know, they got another home run with this one. All right. And the other game I want to talk about today is Multiverses. That's right. Multiverses is back, baby. Uh, developed by Player First Games and published by Warner Brothers. It's the Warner Brothers Cinematic Universe. That's right, two weeks back-to-back where we're talking about cinematic crossover universe games. This time it's a free-to-play online fighter. Last week we talked about X Defiant, which is a free-to-play online shooter. However, this game combines the world of Warner Brothers. Um, So you've got, you know, Looney Tunes, Scooby-Doo, not the actual dog, but other characters from Scooby-Doo, like Velma and Shaggy, uh, DC characters, you've got Batman and Superman, the Gremlins are there, the Iron Giant's there. It's a whole lot of different characters that you might not expect to see uh, in any property, uh, but they're in this game. And that was sort of one of the initial appeals for me when this game was back in beta a while ago. I played a ton of it, and I just, I love these crossovers. Like, I even if there's, like, no substance to them, just something about seeing Batman talk to Bugs Bunny, it just, I love it. And this is what that game is. Um, It is a fighting game, of course. It's in the vein of something like a Nickelodeon All-Stars Brawl or a Smash Brothers, if you're curious what kind of game you're getting into. Now, this is still a great game, but it's definitely still got some polishing that needs to be done. Uh, The weird thing is, it was in beta for forever, then they took it offline for what felt like a year, if not more, maybe. I didn't check the dates, but it felt like a year. It was a long time. And now it's back in its official release, but they've removed some elements that were in the original beta that aren't in the full release now, which really kind of baffle me. Uh, I have two of them here because they're the two that stand out the most. But you can't, to my knowledge, and feel free to tell me if I'm wrong, the ability to change characters in between rematches is just no longer there. You're locked in whatever characters you pick from the beginning, which is like, I'm just surprised by that. I would like to change characters. Uh, it also used to be, I think it used to be, you know, best two out of three, and then the re- you couldn't rematch anymore. Now you can just rematch forever. But unfortunately, because you can rematch forever but can't change your character, it's like, well, eventually I'm going to get tired of playing this character anyway maybe because I'm, you know, I'm not trying to sweat that much in these this games yet. You know, learn all the combos for this one character. I like to jump around, play different characters. Um, but you can't in between rematches, at least not yet. I'm, they'll probably patch it. Uh, Speaking of after match things, the other thing I have down here is there's like no stats after a match. Like you don't know who got the most KOs or who anybody got KOs or what kind of damage you did. Like none of that stuff is there, which is really strange. Uh, And again, they can patch it or maybe there's just something I'm missing. But these things were in the original beta and are just no longer in the full release of the game. And there's stuff that is kind of weird to not have, especially in a fighting game that's online like this. Uh, some, Some other things. The game moved to Unreal Engine 5, and that was kind of why it took so long to come back out. But you can see that change to UB5 with the fluidity of the game. I think the characters move a lot smoother, and, and like, it's hard to describe because I don't know, like, the technical terms of game animation. But I think the characters look a lot smoother, especially when they're jumping or, like, mantling over things. I, that's where I first noticed it. Uh, unfortunately, there are still server issues that plague the original beta that are still here. So it causes the game to lag frequently, which in a fighting game is not... That's like the kiss of death, which is, I think, a lot of why people dropped off initially in that beta. And, of course, I've had a handful of just either network crashes, which were uh, in the middle of a fight, you just get kicked back to the main menu. And I've even had a handful of hard crashes where the game completely freezes 
and the game crashed and I have to restart the whole thing. So, you know, the game was in out of commission, you know, offline for so long in development and it's still having these issues coming out. And I just, I wonder what the problem is, honestly. Um, especially when it comes to that server lag, I, you know, people are going to stop playing a fighting game. You know, people want rollback netcode in their fighting games, let alone servers that function at just the most basic level. And I think they, that probably needs to be priority number one. You know, I complained about the character switching and the UI stuff with the, the stats after a match, but I think you need to lock those servers down and you need to do it quick because, you know, you're going to get that initial boost of people wanting to come back and hop into this game that they maybe liked initially and is now back for them to play, like myself. But if the game becomes, you know, borderline unplayable with server lag in every match, you're going to kill that fan base just as quickly as you did before. Uh, so that's definitely an issue. But hopefully they fix it. You know, I have high hopes. They they clearly want this to be... There's a lot of effort put into this game. I'll put it that way. They they care about these characters, and the movesets for each character feel unique and distinct to them, and they fit the character. You know, it's it's going to sound really dumb, but, like, if you know the lore of Bugs Bunny, right, he's got, like, attacks where he, like, summons a safe or, like, goes in the ground and then comes back up, things like that. You know, the, the, you can tell they, they did their homework on these characters when they were creating them for this fighting game. Uh, and it's, that's the kind of stuff I love. I love being, you know, Shazam or Superman, and you feel, like, you feel the kind of power behind them. Or you can be a faster character like, um, well, not necessarily faster, but like Jake the Dog from Adventure Time. He's kind of like Kirby in terms of if you can, like, change shape and stuff like that. I don't know. I think all the characters are pretty fun to play, and it's fun to see these characters, this Warner Brothers universe, put into a game. I mean, we've seen, like, an injustice. We've seen Batman and Superman and Black Adam and Wonder Woman, but you haven't seen, like, the Gremlins, right? Or, like, <laughs> you know, like, like um, I don't know. The Gremlins is, like, the weirdest one that comes to mind, but I'm sure there's others. I know they just introduced Jason Voorhees, and he's, like, really, like, built for some reason. He's, like, huge. Uh, Agent Smith is coming to the game from the Matrix, so I don't know. I love that stuff, and every time they drop a character, I'm probably going to come back, just like I did in the beta when they dropped characters, just to check them out. Uh, so one other big thing with this re-release of the game, they added a single-player mode. I believe they're called Rifts. It's sort of like a combination of towers from Mortal Kombat, but it's a lot closer to single-player stuff in games like Smash Brothers, where you're doing fights, but then there's also mini-games in between some of the fights, uh, and I just, I gotta say, well, you know what, let's start with the positive. It's a nice addition, right? It's always good to have some kind of PvE thing in your online game, in my opinion, because if you're getting tired of getting stomped by people that are just way better than you at the game, you can boot up the PvE stuff and fight bots, and there are different difficulty levels of the bots, so you don't feel like you're just, um, sort of playing on easy mode, right? You can set it to higher difficulties and, and train like that, just like you would train in any other fighting game, and you can still gain rewards that way as well. Uh, the big negative here is the mini games. Uh, the mini games are honestly terrible. They're brain dead simple, and I really think they need to be either reworked entirely, or I wouldn't be upset if they just removed them. I mean, they're like, they're like, you know, here an example of one is you're on like a cannon, and these balloons are rising up in front of you, and you just move your cursor and shoot the balloons with the cannon. It's like. It's like a game you would, like a plug-and-play game you get from the drugstore. There's one where you're in a tank and there's there's ships or like robots or whatever coming from the left or right of the screen and you have to turn your tank and move your little, um, the barrel of the tank and shoot them. But it's like, like a like a three-year-old could do these. It's, it's insane. <laughs> Maybe I'm missing something here, but like it really feels like really bad. And especially when you just want to do fights and you're, you know, you're locked in doing some of these mini games before you can progress to the next stage of the tower. You know, my friend and I, uh, Joe and I were playing yesterday, or the other day, I forget when, and we found that we could just jump off the map and instantly lose, but it would allow us to progress to the next fight, so we just started doing that because we didn't want to do these mini games. And then, like, we did the one um, rift that ended with a Joker fight, and the majority of the Joker fight was the mini games all in one. Like you didn't really fight the Joker; he flew around in the balloon, and you used like strategies from the other mini games to defeat him. And that was the big final boss, and it was like baffling. <laughs> it, was, it was it was it honestly blew my mind that that was what they did for the big final fight there. Uh, so yeah, mini games are terrible, and I really think 
you know, I'll, I'll just say it. They should just take them out. No one needs that, right? They're fun in Smash Brothers because Smash Brothers is an older franchise and it's sort of nostalgic to do those, like, the I, I don't even remember what they are, but, like, when you're running away from uh, the hand guy and, and things like that or, like, the obstacle course and that, that there's an element of, like, um, nostalgia there, I think, if, you know, if you went from Melee to Brawl to whatever. But there's, like, no reason to have it in multiverses. I think it just it brings the gameplay to a grinding halt and they're, like, brain-dead easy. There's, like, no good, like, feedback even for doing them. It's just terrible. <laughs> like, it really, I don't know why I've got such a bone to pick with it, but it really bothers me. But anyway, you know, I do think you should go check out Multiverses, at least for a couple matches. It's free to play, and I'm sure you can find a character that you either know or like in the Warner Brothers universe. It's the benefit of having the Warner Brothers IP kind of backing this whole thing. You know, there's probably a character that you can find that you'll enjoy. And it's definitely worth trying for a couple matches, even if you do get that server lag. It's not every match, uh, you know, but at the end of the day, the fighting mechanics are still a ton of fun. And it's, you know, it's definitely my kind of game. So I'm I'm definitely going to keep playing it and just praying they fix all the problems and take out those mini games. <laughs> uh, but that's going to wrap up episode 10 of No Credits Roll. Thank you so much for listening. Of course, you can always email questions or comments to nocreditsrolled at gmail.com. You can call in and leave us a voicemail at 856-209-0713. That's 856-209-0713, and we might just play it on the air. Make sure to subscribe to No Credits Rolled on Spotify, Apple Podcast. Anywhere you get your podcast, we'll be there for you. Uh, and if you're feeling generous, of course, you can always check out the Patreon, where you can subscribe for just $3 a month, and you can recommend what I should play and what I should talk about on the show. But hey, that's all I got. I'll see you next time on No Credits Rolled.